Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to what would normally be our Sanctuary Exploration Center Enrichment Presentation Seminar, part of our seminar series. Um, obviously, we're coming to you virtually tonight, so we're happy you are all able to log on. I mean, my name is Chelsea Prindle. I'm the manager of the Sanctuary Exploration Center in Santa Cruz, which means I work for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, but of course, you're all here to see Mark Shargell present his presentation, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, which we'll get to in just, just a moment. So I mentioned I'm the manager of the Sanctuary Exploration Center. If, if you're not from Santa Cruz or the Monterey Bay area, you might not be familiar with this building or this photo, but um, this is a visitor center directly across the street from the Santa Cruz Wharf with the main mission of educating the public on Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, we are free, a free admission visitor center open normally Wednesday through Sunday from 10 to 5. So um, if you are not from maybe from Central California or you're not familiar with uh, National Marine Sanctuaries, we have 14 nationwide. You can see that they're pretty well distributed around um, the coastal area of the United States as well as in our Great Lakes. And sanctuaries are set up as areas of the marine environment with special conservation, recreational, ecological, historical, cultural, archaeological, or aesthetic qualities. Essentially, national marine sanctuaries are special places of the ocean that are set up with extra levels of federal protection. Which brings us home to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, you can see by the black line in the ocean that the sanctuary extends from essentially the Marin Headlands down to Cambria, just south of Big Sur. So that means everything within these black lines are um, protected under federal guidelines to protect the remarkable ecosystems, biodiversity, and animals that call this place home. There's a whole suite of regulations that help protect this area, but one of the main most notable ones that you might be familiar with is the um, preventing oil drilling from happening off our coast. So if you're one of the many, many people who appreciate the fact that we don't have oil rigs off our coast, that is because this is a national marine sanctuary. Which brings us back to the Sanctuary Exploration Center. So I mentioned the Sanctuary Exploration Center. It's a free admission um, visitor center. It's really your taxpayer dollars at work. I hope that the next time you are in Santa Cruz visiting or if you're from here that you're able to stop by. Of course, we are closed now. Um, our staff and all of our volunteers are safely sheltering in place, but we hope that um, sometime in the future we'll be able to reopen and, and have you come in and learn much, much more about Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, in addition to being open to the public, we also host other educational opportunities such as K through 12th grade field trips, family education programs, and topical seminars such as the one tonight. So normally we would be having you in the Exploration Center to hear um, this presentation this evening, but we're happy through modern technology that we're able to reach all of you virtually. Um, which leads me to our, our main event for this evening, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea with Mark Shargell. Mark Shargell has been diving in California coast for over 40 years. It seems like many of you who logged on early are, are familiar with him and with his, some of his history. But he began diving as an undergraduate student at Stanford University in 1978. He's been a spear fisherman, an abalone diver, a scientific diver, and for the last 31 years, a professional underwater photographer. Mark has been an outspoken advocate for marine conservation and particularly for marine reserves for more than 20 years. He's an award-winning photographer who has published photos and books, environmental publications, and magazines. We are super lucky to have Mark take us on an underwater journey today. So without any further ado, Mark, do you want to pass the torch and? And that would be my cue to get us started. So I first want to thank everybody for spending a chunk of your Friday evening with us. And especially a big thank you to Chelsea and the Sanctuary Exploration Center for hosting the evening. Uh, Chelsea uh, put a lot of planning into the evening and rolled with uh, both her and my first foray into doing a large virtual event such as this one. 
Uh, it's been great working with her in the past, doing live events at the Exploration Center, and I look forward to being able to do that again sometime, I hope soon. Uh, speaking of which, let me put in one more word for the Exploration Center, which is a wonderful uh, institution. Their interpretive exhibits are educational, they're accurate, they don't distort anything, they give you valuable information that you'll find really interesting. Uh, next time you are near the boardwalk in Santa Cruz, uh, down by the foot of the wharf there, do yourself a favor uh, when they reopen the doors and pop in there. It's free. So let's go diving because that's what I really love. Scenes like this, I mean, being in a place like this, it's a, it's a cross between bird watching and being in the most majestic cathedral you can imagine. Um, so I want to see, do my best to take you on a virtual dive with me. And those of you who are old enough to remember may recognize that I ripped off the title of tonight's talk from a uh, old 1960s TV, sci-fi TV show. Um, kind of a predecessor to Star Trek, actually. Um, but they set this one in 1979, a very futuristic year. They had submarines that could fly. Um, they had Hollywood actors that would, would look into the camera with all seriousness and then go fight uh, sea monsters made of guys in wearing rubber suits. Uh, the thing was, was kind of funky. Um, but it was one of the things that inspired me as a kid. So we don't need a submarine. We are going to follow uh, the great whales like the blue whale or the humpbacks uh, uh, lunge feeding after sardines. Dive like elephant seals. Well, elephant seals can go a mile straight down. We won't be able to do that, but we can go mm, maybe 100 feet or a little bit more, uh, kind of like maybe the harbor seal. So. Underwater, I'm going to be your guide. This is what I look like. Make sure you're following me and not some other sea creature. We're going to swim with some fish and we're going to stare with the wonderment of a child. This particular child is my son, uh, but that's about 10 years ago. He's over six feet tall and towers above me now. And he's a pretty good diver. Uh, here we are shooting video in Carmel Bay, a uh, school of blue rockfish. This is a lingcod. We're in Point Lobos Marine Reserve where the lingcod are almost tame enough to pet. This is one of our most colorful fish, the vermilion rock cod. And this is surely the strangest fin fish we've got. This is the ocean sunfish, or mola mola. It's a great treat to see one of them on a dive. You can see here I'm with a school, which is which was an amazing thing. When underwater, we, we move to the rhythms of the sea and keep our eyes sharply peeled for unusual sea creatures like this octopus. Now, if mankind ever makes contact with alien life from another planet, I think that it's our work with octopi that will be the best preparation. Um, they're very intelligent. They have not one brain, but eight of them. Um, they can change the color of their skin and texture. And seeing one on a daytime dive is a real treat. But here we have a second octopus on the same rock. Notice the one little sea urchin, that purple thing right above the octopus. But wait, wait. I see a third octopus in the middle of the screen inside the barnacle shell. That was an extraordinary thing. But speaking of extraordinary, once in a great while, we get a transient orca or killer whale uh, off the Carmel coast. This was a day when we had that experience. And my friend and buddy Annalise was shooting video. I was taking stills. Uh, and we were blown away. Uh, Another rare opportunity for terrific fun is when dolphins uh, 
play in the bow wave of our boat. Uh, you have to go fast. The dolphins are much faster than the boat and they get bored with a slow boat. So you, you just open up the throttle and let it rip. And they just, as you can see, they cavort in front of the boat. I've been told that there's a pressure wave in the front of the boat. So for the dolphins, this is a little bit like surfing, which may be why they so much enjoy the experience. They stayed with us for several minutes this one day. I've only had them do this with me a couple of times. Uh, so it was a real treat kind of like the school of ocean sunfish. Another big fish that we have in Central California is the sheep's head. Now, when I started diving, this was a Southern California only fish, but as global warming has proceeded and pulses of warm water have come northward up the coast, so have Southern animals. We'll see some more of them later. This is another warm water event we had a warm blob of seawater come through the area a few years ago. Uh, the sea lions had no food because of the warmth of the water and they all decided that the boat ramp in Monterey would be a good place to hang out. So here's my buddy Annalise that day we dove with all the uh, ocean sunfish. You can see how close she was getting. Um, I got pretty close to get some photographs and look at the tail of this fish. Those are tooth marks. Now, what do you think might have done that? Can you think of an animal that's got a perfectly semicircular jaw that could be, oh, I don't know, a foot or bigger? And this is a pretty big fish that we're looking at, and that was a big bite. Well, I think the animal that did that was the one we call the landlord, the great white shark. Uh, this is the only photograph you're gonna see tonight that was not taken in California. Uh, I, I saw this great white in Mexico. Uh, for those who want to know, yes, I was inside of a shark cage, um, but uh, I, I developed great respect for and an appreciation for the beauty of the great white. Now, I, I think the opposite of beauty is another predator we have in Central California. This is the wolf eel. It looks fearsome. Uh, they've got the personality of a puppy dog. Uh, but the real giants of our ocean are the great big marine mammals like these humpback whales or even the Risso's dolphin, which can be as much as eight feet long. And we see them oh, several times a year. Um, and of course, the favorite marine mammal for pretty much everybody is this fuzzy looking sea otter. So what I want to do is um, take you on a trip all along the California coast. Uh, so far, all the images I've shown you have been from Monterey, Monterey Bay, uh, my home region, which you see highlighted there. The Exploration Center is on the north shore of the Monterey Bay in Santa Cruz. Uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, take you on a coastwise uh, swim, a uh, submarine trip perhaps, uh, from almost the Oregon border up in Humboldt County, uh, southward to the North Central region. Uh, this is Southern Mendocino, Humboldt, Marin counties. Into my home area, uh, Central California. And we'll finish up in Southern California in the offshore islands you see here. These are called the Channel Islands. Um, along the way, we are going to visit some absolutely gorgeous, rich kelp forests. And we're going to talk a little bit about how many of these kelp forests are being destroyed and mowed away by hordes and hordes of sea urchins. And we'll talk about my latest conservation project uh, in concert with several other local divers uh, to see what we can do about stopping and reversing this. So off to the far north coast of California. We're going to start north of Eureka, north of the Humboldt Bay, in a place called Trinidad, not the Caribbean one, but Trinidad, California. Um, one of the prettiest places I have ever seen. Um, in fact, I, I said to myself, I have to get back there. Um, the diving is very different than Central California, but under good conditions, very beautiful. Uh, these great seascapes with these great big multi-armed sea stars. Stars like this are the great white sharks of the invertebrate world. And we'll talk about them a little bit more later. Here's a hermit crab hitchhiking on the back of one. 
Uh, they have plume anemones, which we find all the way down to Southern California. This uh, spotted rose anemone also found all along the coast. A couple of different stars. And this is one of those big multi-armed great white shark of the invertebrate world sea stars. This one is called the sunflower star. Uh, and we're going to talk about him a great deal more later. Uh, this star used to be found all along the California coast from far northern California all the way down into Big Sur. Here we have the stinging sea nettle seen through a very clear surface. Now that was looking upward into the sky, not down at the jelly. And if you see this fish, this is the quillback rockfish, you know you're in Northern California. Those are almost never found south of the Golden Gate. This brings us to the next region of the state, the North Central Coast, um, Mendocino, Sonoma, and some of Marin County. We're here at Sea Ranch looking offshore at uh, adorable looking harbor seal. The kelp here is not the giant kelp that we usually have in Central California, but that bull kelp that you were looking at. At the base of the kelp forest, you can find baby stars, many different kinds of sea slugs or nudibranch. Here's a nudibranch grazing on sponge out in the Farallon Islands, out west of the Golden Gate. A colorful anemone. And from there, I will take you to my home area, the, the, the central coast. And we're going to do this in two pieces. The Monterey Bay region from basically Santa Cruz to Point Sur and then the Big Sur coast from Point Sur southward. All right, so let's go to Carmel, to Point Lobos Marine Reserve, which I mentioned earlier, um, one of the great gorgeous jewels of the coast. And here I am deep below. Uh, here, finding a rock with five different anemones of two types on it. Here's a closer look at that yellow one. This is called the fish eating anemone. This red one is the spotted rose. And these red rockfish we've seen before, this is the vermilion rockfish. This is the lingcod that we met earlier. And deep on the sandy bottom in isolated spots, we see these patches of sand dollars. This fish is a convict greenling. And these little snails are found only in really deep water on the central coast. Uh, I was talking about nudigranks. Here's probably the most colorful one that we have the Spanish shawl, and here's a pair that are actually mating. We have colorful snails too. This is the jeweled top snail, and that gives me a segue to take you a little bit farther south from the Monterey Bay region, south of Point Sur, and we're gonna run the coast from Point Sur as far south as Morro Bay. That's the Big Sur coast. The postcard image that says Big Sur is this spot, this is called McWay Falls. Here I've got a little bit wider image. You see on the left that palm tree, that's an introduced tree. It's not native to Central California. Uh, although you can find some planted in Santa Cruz and some planted here. And you know what else was introduced? The waterfall itself. That's an engineered waterfall built uh, at the behest of the people who built a house no longer standing on about the spot from which I took this photograph. Um, but I got a more interesting view of the falls from the seaward side, standing on a boat in that cove. Uh, I dove off of that boat with my scuba gear and took photographs of all kinds of cool stuff. These gelatinous things are called salps. Here is a pencil jelly. Uh, unusual jelly, we do not see this one very often. And here's a familiar anemone but something unfamiliar. Look at all those little fish. It looks like the tropics. These are all babies of the blue rockfish we saw in the big schools earlier. This happened in 2013. There had never been a year in which this many rockfish hatched for 100 years before since people were taking records, and it hasn't happened again since, a, a very rare event. A trip down the Big Sur coast is, is gorgeous, whether you're underwater or above. Uh, you see the sun setting on the Santa Lucia Mountains. We wake up the next day and see the fog clear. Let's go diving some more. I got to get some more of those snails and a few more different kinds of nudibranchs and another look at uh, the spotted rose anemone. Okay, here's a, a strange customer. This is a juvenile canary rockfish, a fairly scarce fish. 
Uh, this is the opalescent nudibranch. Now you know the, the wing cod and the vermilion lockfish already. And the intimidating looking wolf eel, who, as I said, is really a pussycat. We'll spend one more night down here and wake up. And if we're lucky, we'll have a super calm day like this. We can cruise out past Point Sur itself, which you see here as the fog is clearing and we'll dive a spot I was talking about earlier called Schmieder Bank. Very deep, uh, difficult to dive. Uh, if there's a current running, it's really quite dangerous and you can't go. But I want to get back. It is covered with this delicate hydrocoral. Uh, very fragile stuff. These bushes are probably 100 years old or more. Uh, it's uh, uh, just an amazing place, stock chock full of fish. Uh, a, a remarkable vision anywhere in California to see something like that. That finishes our Big Sur Coast part of the trip and takes us to Southern California. So our point of departure from the shore will be Santa Barbara and we'll head out to these offshore islands called the Channel Islands, the northern group here, the southern group here, and as we leave the shore, we'll get a send off from another harbor seal who will uh, wink us a bon voyage. We will get to journey through more of these amazingly rich kelp forests, habitat for fish and invertebrates. Here's a marine mammal with the California state fish. This is the Garibaldi, and you know why it's the California state fish? Because it's golden. So not the only colorful thing we have, these anemones in green and purple, this little orange crab sheltering in the anemone. And yeah, there's some hydrocoral down there. I don't understand why all the Southern California hydrocoral is purple. Here's another rockfish that looks maybe familiar. This was the canary that we met earlier. This one is the rosy rockfish. You see how similar they look. We have 60 different kinds of rockfish. And uh, telling them apart took me quite a while to learn. Uh, we had the blue banded goby and then the same orange and lavender color combination. This is the electric torpedo ray. He can deliver quite the shock. And bidding us a farewell is that bat ray overhead. So we've now done our tour from far Northern California through Central California. Uh, we've covered a lot of distance. I want to see if we can do just a moment of time travel. This is an awful lot like the clock that was on the wall of my elementary school. I can't take you that back that far. And I wish I had a picture of me diving in 1978 in a wetsuit in an antiquated BC. Here I am 13 years later wearing a dry suit. Um, another 16 years after that at uh, um, Arena Rock. Here I am deep under Point Lobos and at the Carmel Pinnacles on my first rebreather. Uh, Carmel Pinnacles again. This is my second rebreather. And this is just last year. And you remember this. This is what I look like. You've been following me all through California. So the point is, I've had a lot of years to dive and a lot of years to make uh, the observations of a naturalist. So I've seen things happen. I talked about warming seawater, the southern species that have expanded their ranges northward, like the sheep's head, like these kellets whelk that again used to be a Southern California only animal. Now they lay eggs in great numbers along the Big Sur coast and up to Carmel. Um, another thing that I've seen is the direct impact of people. This is mostly from fishing. Um, so here's another school of blue rockfish, but this one goes back uh, 28 years ago. I snapped this photograph near the breakwater in Monterey. Notice the rich kelp growing in the background. That kelp is not there anymore. We're going to talk about that. Um, the blue rockfish schools, uh, I thought I was seeing that the schools were less numerous close to the harbors where people congregate. And it seemed like the fish were getting smaller. Uh, now here we are at Point Lobos Marine Reserve. Again, a no-take, no fishing area. Great big school, great big fish. And it turns out the scientific data verified what I thought I was seeing. 
uh, that they could measure the impacts of fishing on not just these fish, but marine life of all kinds. So the scientists said what you can do about this is create protected areas, um, essentially parks underwater. Uh, we call them marine reserves where nothing can be removed. And there is a story of a tremendous effort that the state of California um, executed with great difficulty, but ultimately with great success uh, about 15 years ago. And if you go to my website, livingseaimages.com, click on conservation, and you can read that history. Um, I was involved, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, had a hand in helping to draw the maps for the protected areas in Central California. But it's not just that people have an impact on the sea. The sea has a tremendous impact on people, which is another reason conservation is so important. Here I am in a school of sardines. This is the only time I've had this experience. And as soon as I say sardines and Monterey together, many of you know where I'm going next, which is inside the canneries that used to exist along the street we now call Cannery Row in Monterey. There were more than 40 of these giant seafood processing factories in one little, uh, oh, less than a mile of, uh, of what became an industrial park. In 1945, it looked like this. Um, it is just a hub of activity. They are canning fish and making money. All through the Great Depression, the city of Monterey, and especially the fish canneries, thrived. They didn't really have the depression in Monterey because of this industry. In the late 1940s, the sardines failed. There had been warnings for years that they were being overfished, and finally, they were forced to pay the piper. Cannery Row languished for more than 35 years. It looked like this in 1973. I got to Monterey for the first time in 1978, just five years later. Cannery Row still looked like this. In the early 1980s, another great marine interpretive institution was created, the Monterey Bay Aquarium at the far end of Cannery Row, and it began a transformation. Cannery Row went from industrial park to derelict to once again being the economic driver of the city of Monterey, but this time not on fish, but on tourists. And the tourists were coming to look not at fish on a plate, but fish in aquarium tanks, uh, fish in the ocean, sea otters on the surface, those harbor seals that you saw earlier. Uh, an amazing transformation. And the marine life became more valuable alive in the ocean than it was taken out. So I have one more story, um, a very intricate one, of changes that I have seen. And this is an unfinished story. We don't really know how it ends. We don't even know exactly why it started. So we're going to play a game of Clue with ecosystem changes in the Central California Ocean. Uh, so here we are at the bottom of a kelp forest, uh, dozens of species just in this one photograph. Uh, big adult gopher rockfish, little blue rockfish, several different um, anemones. We've got barnacles, we've got tube worms, we've got sponges. Uh, <laughs> There's, there, there are as many as 1,500 species that are native to a kelp forest, making it the most diverse ecosystem uh, in California, possibly on the West Coast. So the clue that we're looking for is what turns a thriving ecosystem with hundreds or thousands of species into something that looks like this, basically an underwater desert overrun by one thing, this case sea urchins. So let's assemble some suspects. Uh, what about that great big multi-arm sea star? Could it play a role in this story? Well I told you it has eaten urchins. Maybe it does. Well there's the urchin. We know that's probably the murderer. Um, but what about the sea otters? Didn't they eat shellfish? Weren't they going to control the urchins? Mm. Uh, we don't even know really what the weapons were, but we know that there was something in this story that played a role, a virus. Not this one, 
it was a sea star virus. And in 2013, basically every sea star from Southern California up to British Columbia, the entire west coast of North America, lost almost all of its sea stars. This viral disease just caused them to, to, to dissolve in place. Uh, it was horrifying to see. So here's one suspect. And among the sea stars that disappeared was this one that we met earlier, the, the sunflower star. And as I told you, they are sea urchin predators. Uh, like I said, the great white shark of the invertebrate world. But urchins, they, they're not afraid, they're not eaten by other kinds of stars. Here's a pretty big star, but the urchins are right next to it, they don't mind. So we think that one of the things that allowed this outbreak of sea urchins was the absence of that star. But again, what about otters? Otters eat urchins, don't they? Well, yes, I know they do. I've watched them do it. It's amazing to see an, uh, an otter just bite into a spiny urchin. Otters love the kelp forest. They're one of the things that thrive in the kelp forest. And you've seen these pictures of otters wrapping themselves in kelp. Uh, it's a way that they can uh, be sure of staying put, not drifting in a current. They can nap, they can rest, um, they, they love the kelp forest. They also love eating urchins that live in a kelp forest where the urchins have plenty of kelp to eat. The urchins get the equivalent of fat full of nutrition and the otters die for them and eat them when they can. The kelp grows up from the bottom, continues growing when it reaches the surface, the stuff floats and lays out this canopy that the otters love. The urchins meanwhile, are on the bottom and they eat kelp. And what they do is they eat right at the base of the kelp. They crawl maybe a few inches up the stalks and they chew and you can see how chewed up this one looks. Or the urchins rather have basically killed it already. Already. So what does a healthy kelp plant look like? Well, let's take a look. Um, this is giant kelp. Uh, down at the bottom is the algae equivalent of roots. This is called the holdfast down here. The reproductive organs of the plant are here, and the stalks are more properly called stipes, have these little float bulbs. These are filled with gas. The whole plant floats, and when it reaches the surface, it continues growing and spreads out on the surface. And from the bottom to the top is habitat for all kinds of stuff. Um, those of you with sharp eyes can see a fish here and a fish here. Here's a snail, here's another snail. If we look closely, we'd see more fish, we'd see nudibranchs, we'd see all kinds of stuff in the kelp. The urchins come along and mow it off at the base, and the kelp plant drifts away in the current, and there goes your kelp forest. It's gone. Um, if some of it falls to the bottom, you can see how avidly scores of urchins just jump on the stuff and um, feed on it eagerly. And they will continue to multiply until, as you've seen in some photographs already, there's basically nothing left. So when this happens, we lose habitat for, as I said, all kinds of things. Um, we'll see jellies uh, drifting through the kelp forest, fish of many different kinds. Here's uh, at least two or three different types here. Here's the vermilion rockfish in the background. There's a perch, crabs like this kelp crab. Uh, many type, different types of snails. Here's a snail perched on a blade of kelp. Uh, here's a nudibranch, the opalescent nudibranch on another blade of kelp. This is a blade of kelp encrusted by um, invertebrate life. That nudibranch is eating it. Um, and when the urchins take over, there's really little left but this. So we wish for a comeback of the sunflower star. Uh, and whereas per pretty much every other star has made a comeback since the 2013 event, nobody has seen a sunflower star since. They're absent. Uh, and perhaps as a result, we have places like Point Lobos, and this is one of my favorite spots inside of Point Lobos that you're looking at, has turned into urchin barren. Here we have a lingcod. Um, a few other things, but not much for a lingcod to eat because uh, the habitat has been destroyed. Now here you can see urchins in a transitional area, a lot of invertebrate life on these rocks, 
but this is far more urchins than used to be natural before the 2013 event. You used to see on a dive an urchin or two deep within a crack hiding probably from otters, maybe from the, the sunflower star. And today, this is uh, south of Point Lobos, uh, still in the reserve, um, we have this. So what does this mean for the Monterey Pacific Grove area where um, the, 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 the heaviest concentration of diving uh, on the west coast occurs? So here we are at the Monterey Harbor in the lower right. Here's brown patches. That's kelp. That's the, that's the canopy on the surface of a kelp forest that we saw in my photograph earlier. Here's more kelp here. The aquarium is right there. Hopkins Marine Station, where I was a student over 40 years ago, is on this point of land. Uh, here's a bunch more kelp by Lover's Point. A whole lot more kelp as we head out west toward finally get here to Point Pinos. Um, and there's kelp all along the shoreline. So here's a, this is a satellite photograph from 2007. It continued to look about this way uh, right up until 2013, 2014, maybe around 2015 when the urchins really began to take over. Within a couple of years in 2017, it looked like this. Where is the kelp? It's gone. We've lost something like 90% of our coverage of kelp in this area. Uh, let's look at it again. Okay, kelp, 2007. 2017, almost none. So I told you about creating marine protected areas back uh, almost 15 years ago. Um, the red areas in this map are marine reserve. The blue areas are marine conservation area. Some fishing is allowed, a lot is prohibited. Uh, there's specific regulations about what can and cannot be taken. Um, but all of this is area with some special kind of protection uh, about removal of marine life. All of these areas are within the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, but the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is huge, uh, and these represent less than 1% of the total area of the sanctuary. So let's look farther down the coast. So now we're looking at Pebble Beach. Down here is Carmel Bay, and you can see that almost all of the diving accessible area from the Monterey Harbor all the way around to here, this area gets battered by waves. It's pretty hard to dive here. Um, again, same thing down here, and you have to pay a gate fee to a private company to, to even drive on the road down here. So very little diving occurs here. This is all cliffs. You can't get in the water. Uh, and so then as we go a little bit farther south and look at Carmel Bay, um, we have this conservation area all in Carmel Bay. Here's Point Lobos right here. This is where I launched my boat. And we've got a nice big marine reserve here, which is why Point, one of the reasons why Point Lobos is so rich with marine life. These places matter. They are the places that we have specifically said, this is the best of what we have, it's the richest habitat. We're gonna make these essentially nurseries for fish and invertebrate life and um, protect them from direct human um, manipulation and exploitation. So I'm worried. Um, I worked really hard on getting these put into legal effect uh, years ago. And um, I showed you Point Lobos turning into Urchin Baron. Here's an urchin baron I photographed 25 years ago in Southern California. Uh, 18 years later, I went back and took a photograph just a, a 100 yards away from that other rock. And it's still all urchins. Uh, and here, there's a bunch of brittle stars that joined in. There's hardly anything else living here. Um, it's, a, it's a very degraded uh, environment now. Um, the fact that it's been that way for you know, I think 25 years now, suggests that once these areas become urchin barren, they stay that way for a very long time. Um, okay, so somebody is probably texting Chelsea, well, why don't we just go do some scuba diving and collect the urchins or just crush them like a, like a, like a sea otter would do? Okay, great idea. In fact, uh, there's a few people who had that idea quite some while ago 
However, um, what they're trying to do so far is illegal. Uh, the bag limit for urchins is 35. Now we have a graduate student studying this issue who estimated that somewhere between 150 and 200 million sea urchins live uh, around the Monterey Peninsula. We're gonna have to do hundreds of dives, taking out hundreds of urchins per diver, even to make a dent to clear a few acres um, for experimental purposes, which is what we're trying to get done. But in order to do that, we need uh, the California Fish and Game Commission to change the law so we don't become criminals for trying to save uh, kelp forests. Now, the problem started up in Humboldt, Mendocino, and Sonoma counties sooner than it did in um, Monterey. And they've already got their change in the regulation. Divers can take uh, 40 gallons, hundred, uh, hundreds of urchins up there. Uh, like what I said we need to do. But so far, to do that in Central California, in Monterey, is illegal. You could be cited, fined, even arrested and jailed for doing that. <sighs> Doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, I'm appealing to you to enlist your help with the political side of this. And for those of you who have the ability and the interest, even maybe with the uh, conservation side of it directly. Um, if you go to livingseaimages.com uh, slash voyage after the talk is over, you'll be able to volunteer to be a political activist to put pressure on the Fish and Game Commission for that change in the regulations we need. If you're a diver, you can volunteer to take your hammer and crush a few hundred urchins, I hope, sometime soon. Uh, this is being done in fairly shallow water. Uh, so we'll need many volunteer divers once we can get underway legally. And finally, um, for those of you who have a great deal of experience and lots of diving skill, I'm always looking for people to do some of the crazy extreme diving that I like to do. So again, if you go back to livingseaimages.com slash voyage, after the talk, you will magically see a link to where to send me an email. And if you can do any of those three things, I hope you will. While you're on my website, um, you'll have the opportunity to read one of my four books. This is Yesterday's Ocean. Uh, it's available in paperback, but it's also available right on my website to read online. Um, it contains many more stories of amazing things that have happened to marine ecosystems. Most of them are due to direct human manipulation. One of those stories is how did this mountain of abalone shells get dumped north of Monterey in the 1920s and 30s. Now, don't go there, the shells are gone. They've been carted away already. Um, but you can read the story, which I don't have time to tell you tonight, in yesterday's ocean. Uh, also on my website, you can see my hardbound coffee table books, glossy printing, chock full of colorful photographs. Uh, there are three of them in the Wonders of the Sea series. And each one of them connects to one of the regions of California uh, on which I took you on tour earlier this evening. I can't do a book signing tonight, but if you want to order a book, there is a, a facility on the website to say, yes, Mark, would you please sign my book and, and write, you know, write my name in it or write to my favorite person I want to give it as a gift to. And I'll be happy to do that for you. Also on the website are oh, a couple hundred different styles of note card, different images, um, fine art prints from these small sizes all the way up to something big enough to cover your wall. And finally, um, if you didn't already, would you please send email to explorationcenter at noaa.gov so Chelsea and her folks can keep in touch with you and let you know the goings on at that wonderful exploration center in uh, the foot of the wharf right along the edge of the ocean in Santa Cruz. So my great thanks to everybody um, for spending a chunk of your evening with me. It's been wonderful. Uh, thanks to Chelsea for organizing. And I am ready to take your questions. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. 
Um, so yeah, we, as Mark had said, he just put the um, email address up for the Exploration Center at noaa.gov. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat box as well. Um, many of you RSVP'd, which we really appreciate. It means that we are able to follow up with you um, and particularly send you a, a very quick survey about our presentation this evening. We're hoping to do more of these, um, especially as the center remains closed. And so your feedback is very important. So I'm going to go ahead and put the link to the um, the survey right in the chat box. You can click on it at a later time. In a second, I'll, I'll type in the, um, the Exploration Center at noaa.gov so you have it there as well. So this is the time where if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat box. Make sure that you don't just send it to Mark. Make sure that you send it to me, Chelsea Prindle. Um, and you can also, if you feel comfortable, you can go ahead and go to participants and select raise your hand and I'll see you and I can unmute your mic and you're welcome to um, ask Mark any questions there uh, or you'll be able to ask them verbally. I do need to tell you, Mark, that Cooper has joined on and he wanted to say hi. Hi, Coop. <laughs> Glad you made it. Um, so, so no hands yet. I, I did have a question that um, the dive that you're at in, in Big Sur, where you had the beautiful hydro corals, how deep were you? Uh, that dive site, uh, I think I mentioned it's real deep and you better be real good. Um, it starts at 120 feet and down from that. So I was probably 130, 135 feet deep when I snapped the photographs you were looking that were with all that, that garden of hydro coral. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's 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 a dive for prepared, skilled divers. So even if you were to dive in the middle of the day there, um, I'm I'm sure that at that depth it wouldn't be very light. Do you have significant amount of lights attached to your? No, it would depend on the day, and I, I appreciate the question. It's a really good one because it's one of the reasons I want to get back there. Mm -hmm. um, it, the days that I have been there. Um, have been days where there was a, a, an algae bloom in the top, oh, I don't know, 30 to 50 feet of the, of the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and that filters away all the light. You get down to 50, 60, 70 feet, and you get below the algae layer, um, the plankton layer, rather. And, and the water is clear, but there's not much light. And the photographs that I showed you were from days like that. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like diving, not quite at night, but in dusk, late, late dusk. Uh, uh, the, the photographs were, were taken using light that I brought with me. Um, otherwise, you would have seen nothing. Um, so I want to get back there on a day when it's clear and really bright. And it gets like that sometimes, but you have to be lucky. All right, so we do have a question coming in from Sandy. Hi, Sandy. It's, once the kelp is gone, what do the urchins eat? Um, that is a brilliant question. and. I'm going to wave my hands and basically say, we don't know. Um, I have a theory that um, there's a, a little film of uh, green algae uh, that they're managed, they manage to subsist upon. Um, what is, and now anybody who knows basic ecology understands this notion of carrying capacity, which is when any animal eats itself to the limit of its food supply, uh, they stop multiplying and their numbers are going to go down and things are going to come back into balance, which is what you would expect with the urchins and the kelp and the algae. It doesn't seem to work that way. And it is one of the great mysteries of that game of Clue that we were playing earlier. How are urchins able to multiply? And they are multi there. So we have, we have young urchins settling in uh, the, the, what used to be kelp forests around Monterey, baby urchins. Um, and yet their parents are emaciated. So how they manage to do that, I don't know. And I haven't heard anybody who th even thinks they know. Um, and yet here it is happening, which seems to be the key to why the urchin barons stay urchin barons for so long. All right, just a reminder, if folks want to verbally ask a question, you can just raise your hand by going down to participants and selecting raise hand. But um, I, <laughs> I have somebody asking a question that I'll ask on there. Um, Alan has a question mark. When do we send emails to the Fish and Game Commission? Re the next vote. Um, Alan, thanks for that question. I, I appreciate you and I know um, 
that you've been involved in marine conservation for about as long as I have, and I've appreciated all you've done um, and what you will be doing in the future. The Fish and Game Commission meeting at which the, um, the issue about changing the regulations will be decided will happen on June 24 and 25. So we're gonna have uh, a full court press on convincing the commission to do the right thing, probably starting around oh, the last week of this month or the first of June. Um, and I think I saw Keith Rootsert on uh, the call here and uh, Keith may have more to say about that because he's really been uh, the lead guy uh, and, and a big shout out to Keith for all he has done uh, for divers and for preserving kelp for us. I'm looking for Keith to see if I can unmute him. Okay, I think you can send a request, but he has to want to be unmuted. So in, in the meantime, we're, we're maybe waiting for, oh, there he is, hi. Oh, I am unmuted, hey, how about that? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Hey, thanks for the shout out. Yeah, the, we're, we're trying to get something before the commission. Right now we're kind of negotiating with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Department to see what kind of regulations uh, we can get going in Monterey to allow recreational divers to, to call urchins in specific areas in the South Monterey Bay. And um, it'll come before the commission on June 24th that we're gonna ask a lot of divers and people to write in to the commission uh, ahead of that meeting um, and in support of the petition. Uh, we had a, a vote uh, before the commission on April 16th and uh, 260 divers wrote in to the commission in, in favor of the petition. Uh, that we that we submitted. So uh, it, was, it was really because of a lot of uh, the diving community really stepping up, and, and that's really what we need to move the ball forward on this because this is going to be a really large effort in Monterey, and it's not going to be easy. And it's going to take a lot of time, and uh, we need uh, political help, and we need divers in the water to uh, to get this work done. So we're looking forward to everybody helping on this. Keith, did I get it right that we'll we'll start the the the, the political action at, at the end of May or the first of June? Yeah, yeah. About like beginning of June or something, we should have some more direction and what Fish and Wildlife is going to um, come to the table with uh, in that negotiation. And then uh, you know, if we get something approved, then it would be thirty days. And so uh, look forward to the end of July uh, when we just start uh, getting hammers in the water, so to speak. Okay. Um, and Melanie just sent a chat to me. And ready I, to go diving. Yeah. Uh, Melanie just sent a chat to me and I sent it out to everybody that says people can sign up for their newsletter um, and they'll let you know when, when they're starting that campaign. So that's in everybody's chat if you want to follow that link as well. Yeah, so um, that's the website that Keith and Melanie are running uh, about the scientific diving effort and the project to restore kelp. And that is the letter G like George, numeral two, K for kelp, R for restoration.com, G2KR.com. So while people are writing that down, we have another question, which is, um, do scientists know why those sunflower sea stars have not returned yet while the other species have? Oh, a wonderful question. And another one that I'm gonna just go back to the game of Clue. We don't know. and um, pretty much every other species of star that we lost between 2013 and 2015 have made a comeback. I could rattle off oh, four or five different species at least um, and more and the sunflower star has not been seen and just to, to, to tell you how complete their disappearance is, um, some people have been calling them locally extinct I've talked to marine biologists who have not seen any anywhere in California, all the way down to hundreds of feet deep with remote operated vehicles, mm -hmm. not a one. I know of one diver who reported seeing one um, south of Carmel within the last few years, and that is the only credible report of which I've heard. Has uh, there been any talk of reintroducing them? Uh, another brilliant question. There is uh, apparently a population up in the San Juan Islands of Washington. Um, so reintroduction by, by human means, uh, human intervention, would require being able to breed them in captivity 
And I think people are trying to do it, but I don't know of anybody who's succeeded yet. So until we've got some, you know, little palm of your hand sized uh, uh, sunflower stars to seed around the reefs, which we don't have, uh, we can't do it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, that, that, was, that was one of the million dollar questions in all of this whole thing is like, how do the urchins manage to reproduce? Where are the sea stars? Uh, it's, things have gone haywire and we don't really understand why they're staying haywire. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, another question that um, I'm sure you're happy to answer, which is, do you do speaking engagements at local scuba clubs, at least after we're able to do in-person speaking engagement again, um, um, particularly it, around the San Francisco Bay Area? Yeah, indeed I do. And in fact, I have done. Um, there are many people uh, on the, uh, uh, involved right now um, that have heard me speak at dive clubs, oh, from, gosh, I don't know, Marin County down to Monterey at least, and, and as far east as uh, the East Bay, uh, have done and, and will be happy to do so again. And, uh, but I, I got to warn you, I'll be talking at least for a few minutes about this urchin problem, because right now it's, uh, as you can tell, there's kind of a fire underneath me uh, to see if we can do something about getting this fixed. But um, yeah, I've been speaking to schools and civic groups, Kiwanis clubs and retiree groups and, uh, and lots of dive clubs for years. And I love to do it. Great. Um, I have, a, I have a, another question here that is, uh, you spoke about marine protected areas um, and that they were a huge successful implementation. Have they been successful in marine conservation since their uh. implementation? That, that was a great question, but a softball. Um, <laughs> um, a tremendous amount of effort has also been invested in monitoring these areas once they were established. And I told you the, the, the creation of them is a long drawn out story of, of, uh, of, of angst uh, that you can read some of on my website, uh, but we got it done. Um, we got a pretty good set of, of marine protected areas created and then we went into monitoring and because it's cold water and things grew slow, grow slowly in cold water, we expected that it would take 10, 20, 30 years before we'd have measurable results. After five years, the initial set of data was in and there were measurable increases in the number of fish, the size of fish, the number of different kinds of fish. That was largely expected because people fish for fish, people eat fish. Also within the marine, well, especially within the marine reserves that are no tech, not only were there more and bigger fish, there were more invertebrates, more different kinds of invertebrates. Um, it seemed that the kelp forests were more robust. So the, the lesson that we derive from this is, and, and, and this is pretty well established science now, not only do these protected areas work, but they create stronger, more robust ecosystems um, that we expect to be um, more resistant to perturbations like global warming, like pollution events. Um, they, they seem to be better in every way, um, with one sad exception, which I've illustrated all too often this evening, which is when the urchins come in, uh, nothing stands in their way yet, except maybe some intrepid divers with hammers. All right, so, so Alan has a follow-up question to that, which is how successful have the urchin culling experiments been up on the North Coast? And does it provide any more incentive for Monterey? You know, I haven't seen any data from that. And if there's somebody uh, in the group that, that has, uh, wave your hand and, and we'll let you give us a capsule report. So I don't know um, if they've got data that shows uh, kelp restoration. Um, what I can tell you is that the, the plan that Keith is, okay, Keith has something to say. <laughs> the plan that Keith is, is promoting is to create a, uh, 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 an exception in the fish and game rules so that they can um, do essentially an experimental protocol research to see if there's a way that we can determine that will lead to the regrowth of the kelp forests that are, are being destroyed. 
So Keith, I'm trying to, I'm doing my best to unmute. I can do it. Oh, there you go. Please do. Keith, what do you know about the North Coast? <laughs> So uh, on the North Coast last year, there was a lot of effort that was uh, coordinated by Josh Russo and the Waterman's Alliance. And um, there were events staged that were every other month to go to uh, various coves and remove urchins with recreational divers. And there was a lot of turnout at first. There was like 100 divers at some of the early events. And um, the, the regulations were changed from 20 gallons per diver per day to 40 gallons per diver per day. And now in... Uh, in 2020, well, and, and to, to say that 2019, there was not successful uh, recruitment of kelp. Basically, it was, did not persist. Um, and there was also, in, in, in concert with that, was a lot of uh, commercial removal of urchins as well, but with the commercial diving fleet uh, that was out of work. So, but in 2020, what Fish and Wildlife has done is, is they uh, created a special uh, provision to try and make a kelp oasis uh, up by Fort Bragg in Mendocino County. Um, one site is Casper Cove that's going to be used recreational divers just to, uh, to call the urchins and there are two other sites there uh, that are going to be done by commercial divers uh, to remove the urchins and that's all going to be monitored by reef check uh, in the coming year. Now in Monterey uh, we did have an experiment going and uh, in Monterey because we were able to go in there and um, basically our experiment is to determine what is the threshold density um, of when an urchin barren can become a kelp forest again. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long, Mark, just tell me. Um, but basically the, um, to go from a kelp forest to an urchin barren takes about six urchins per square meter and you'll become a barren. But to go from a barren to a kelp forest we think it's an order of magnitude less, or about 0.6 urchins per square meter. And last summer we went and um, pulled all these urchins on these on these sites and tried to have graduated levels of urchin density. And we didn't think we had any success, but we found out last week that we did have success because there was some kelp that persisted on our very lowest density target. And uh, there's there's a nice. Uh, Macrocystis kelp there that I'm very proud to uh, so my little baby from a year's worth of work but it just kind of shows that um, by smashing urchins you can restore kelp yeah, um, so but and that's that's kind of the proof right so that the effort in Monterey will be more uh, more general and uh, we're going to have a lot uh, larger areas and um, ReefCheck will be involved in doing the monitoring for that too we're, it's very you know we're, we're very uh, aware of the, the implications of this and uh, you know, being very careful uh, that we're not going to create a spawning event by smashing urchins and, and so on uh, and bring science with us uh, to the to the equation here do monitoring before and after and uh, see what the community response is to to this kind of effort in monitoring so that's our hope sorry thank you mark Thanks, yeah. Keith. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. he sounds like he's a marine scientist it's because he is a citizen scientist and, uh, and, and leader. Um, so I, again, I want to I want to thank him for all the effort he's put into this thing. Uh, we can hope we can uh, assemble teams of divers who can clear some areas and see if the kelp can grow back. Mm -hmm. So kelp. a similar question is, um, has does, is Monterey Bay Aquarium, Long Marine Lab, or other local research institutions participating in possible urchin removal? Well, I wish they were. Um, so some of the some of the uh, the institutions you mentioned are really science based. They're not advocacy, mm -hmm. um, so they typically don't get involved in politics. Um, but they can inform politics. When we did the marine protected areas 15 years ago, we had a science advisory team made up of people from UCSC and Long Marine Lab and uh, many other local institutions of marine science, and um, they were really very helpful in explaining to us, so if you do this, we can expect this kind of result. And if you do that, we can expect that kind of result. And so here's how you should go about, you know, the guidelines, the principles for designing your, your network of protected areas. Um, some of the other institutions could get involved in the politics and even have political arms, um, but have not done so yet. I know Keith has reached out to some of them without success. So, um, uh, if there's an organization that you think 
could be helpful in um, our project, I would urge you to write some letters and say, hey, um, you know, the, the, the kelp forests that um, you study or that you display um, are, are disappearing. Uh, you really need to get involved in helping the effort to do something about it because um, we need all the help we can get at this point. Great. All right. We were planning on being on the call for about another five minutes. So if anybody else has any last minute questions, again, go ahead and raise your hand or enter it into the chat box. Stay on for just um, a few more I minutes. see one. Has anybody come up with a large scale way to remove mm -hmm. urchins? Um, it basically, it's done by hand. Um, I mean, you could imagine some great big machine going along the ocean bottom and scooping up all the urchins or crushing all of it. Unfortunately, if you scoop up all the urchins, you scoop up anything else that's there. Um, we, we, we had this problem with shrimp fishing and they would just scoop up everything on the bottom. There'd be a lot of shrimp there and there'd be a lot of other things there and they were killing patches of ocean. So unfortunately, it has to be done by hand, by the hands of, of scuba, volunteer scuba divers. Um, we think probably the most efficient way is the one that was in the photograph you saw, a big guy with a big hammer, or maybe just a small person with a big hammer, because underwater, you know, you, it doesn't matter what you weigh, you're weightless, but the hammer, um, you know. Um, it's also done by bagging them and hauling them to the surface, but that frankly is a lot of work and removes the biomass of the urchin from the reef. So I think, and this is just my opinion, not scientifically based, um, we're probably better to just smash them in place. The fish will eat the guts, the spines in the shell turn back into sand pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, so essentially we'll use the urchins to help feed all the stuff that they've been crowding out. Yeah, so similarly, um, David has a question, what can be done with urchins? Are they good to eat? Hmm. Well, as the sea otters know, a well-nourished urchin is wonderful food. Um, if you go to a sushi bar and ask about something called uni, U-N-I, uni, um, that is sea urchin row. And back in the day when I was going to Sonoma County and diving for abalone, um, my friend said, hey, bring back a couple of those great big urchins with you. Uh, when you're gonna, I, I looked at him and I said, you want urchins? He said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, bring, bring two or three urchins. I thought he was nuts, but I did as I, it wasn't hard to do, and just grab an urchin, you know, you have to kind of knock it off the, the, the um, rock so you can handle it, because um, they're spiny. Um, but once they're free floating, it's not too bad, and you throw it in the bag with the abalone and you bring it back. Um, he whacked it open and the urchins are symmetrical, kind of like a five-pointed star with that, that they have no points. There's five kind of finger-sized yellow bands of row inside of a well-nourished urchin. And it is rich food. Um, uh, you just eat it and go, whoa, I've been energized. It's like, it, you know, I don't drink energy drinks, but uni, fresh uni is like an energy drink to me. Um, unfortunately, the ones in the urchin barrens don't have enough food to produce the row and they're of no value to you or me or even a sea otter, um, sadly, because as I said, they're, they're emaciated. How they're managing to subsist, I'm, I'm still not clear. That, that sort of answers David's follow-up question, which was, when smashed in place, do they release eggs and sperm and thus are able to, to spawn and reproduce? Um, no, they- It sounds they, like they don't have any. No, they, they have to spawn in synchrony. So the, the way urchins, the way all the animals in, in, in their group spawn is they release clouds of sperm and eggs at the same time usually synchronized to some phase of the moon at a certain season of the year and so um, and I've seen um, that they're referred to as smoking urchins I've seen this yeah. um, where you see an urchin that looks like there's smoke coming out of it but you're underwater and that's either sperm or eggs and those mix they'll fertilize in the water just free floating uh, lead to larvae and that's how they uh, that's how they reproduce. But smashing an urchin can't cause them to spawn. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna um, maybe take 10 seconds here to see if there's any last, last call for any last minute questions. I'm gonna use that time to, again, um, to 
to paste the link to the survey if you wouldn't mind taking, I think it'll make maybe two minutes after this call if you wanted to do the survey. Um, but otherwise, we, we will probably say goodbye in just a second. Do you have a slide with that link on it? I don't, because I made it too late, but there, it just went out to the chat box again. And if anybody RSVP'd with me, they'll, they'll be getting it, but if any of you are on and wanna okay, so on, that'd be great. So if you're willing to do the survey, if you'd send email to explorationcenter mm -hmm. at noaa.gov, um, or even to me, and here, I'll put this up again. So while you're doing that, Alan has another excellent question is, did this get recorded? The answer is yes. And can I get a copy? I will Mark, that's a question for you. putting the recording on YouTube and I will make the, uh, the link public on my website within the next week or so. Yeah. And thank you for asking. Yeah. So and with that, I think this is a, a, a good point to say goodbye, um, especially leaving the Living Seas images um, up and the picture of you sort of saying goodbye to us. Uh, but I've, I've certainly enjoyed this presentation. I've enjoyed um, being able to chat with all of you. And um, again, I hope you do stay in touch either by going to um, the Living Sea Images website and emailing through Mark to get on his listserv or his um, mailing list, as well as doing the same for the Exploration Center because we will be having more of these virtual opportunities, especially as um, this, this pandemic and this crisis continues. So distract us for a little bit and hopefully we can go into a different world and see what's happening underneath the water. Um, Chelsea, so that, I, yes. I want to take a sec to echo your thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody who spent a chunk of your Friday evening with me. Um, I appreciated your presence, your interest in my photography, uh, and especially your interest in marine conservation. Um, if, you, uh, if you access the link that's on the screen and send me an email, I will make sure to, that I keep in touch with you via my newsletter. Uh, thanks so much for being here. And especially, Chelsea, thanks to you for uh, running the evening and to the Exploration Center for sponsoring the event. It's been wonderful. Of course. Like I said, we hope to see you all in person as soon as we can. <laughs> and here in the meantime. All right. Right, that was why I am asking the question of does it make time to spend some of the weekend oh, yeah. at your house? And she said she's, you know, it would be good for a few days at some of that time. Uh, hey, as, uh, as people are, are trailing out, I've, I've unmuted anybody in case anybody oh, hung around to, to, to talk with me. We use poor parents. Yeah, and I think under ordinary circumstances, it won't really matter whether it's weekend or weekday when I'm at my house because my work. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's equally taxing most of the time. It's because it's a little different. Awful. Any time is on the train. This is very different, too. Yeah, I mean, like, like it feels like over the past couple of weeks, your work has been more demanding.
Well, it has, but it goes back to not being demanding at all. And this week, so she's a bunch of stuff that doesn't need to happen. Good service, like that, we won't manage to make a decision to actually start doing. Because my boss is too busy being the technician to actually pay attention to where we are on project. Thanks for coming, everybody. Good night. Good night.